All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's BPA Tech Meet. Today we're going to talk about open source and homebrew gaming. And thank you, Dale, for trying to put your little uninvited software on my friendly machine or someone with a machine. So the first thing, of course, you're doing any type of programming development on any type of system, you got the first thing you want to look at would be that you saw a CPU and the RAM and the hardware you're trying to actually go to. The prime example would be the actual example I have here. So, I'll load up this home drive made earlier on. And we get ready to go from there. I just kind of pay attention about how low, how slow this thing gets low. And one thing you want to take into consideration is the fact that this machine only has probably about 32 megs of RAM and a 200 megahertz processor. <laughs> so, of course, what you see happening on this machine is going to be a lot different than you're going to see on this desktop. Okay. I mean, on this laptop. But now, which machine is that that you have it loaded on? Uh, the Dreamcast was a bootloader and an SD card reader. Dreamcast, that's old school. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see the low screen is starting to come up slowly but surely on the machine. And for those that don't know me, we have Bowen, IAP, MSCIS, also have my Security Plus, and so, sorry, so I'm a hacker. I also do some part time teaching at UD Mercy, and also an instructor. Full time job I'm actually doing IT work with the government, doing various jobs. I'm currently also a member of BDPA, mostly the TAC committee, as well as a member of the outside of Black Engineers. And hopefully I can get money to start a PhD program. <laughs> Although I can get enough money. <laughs> and of course, speaking about software security, CPU processors, and RAM, one thing you gotta look out for, especially dealing with the Windows environment, will be your memory leaks. And of course, Windows was actually started many attacks in the past, mostly due to memory issues and perhaps poor use of dynamic variables, which actually plagued many other operations as well, even on certain Unix machines. However, dynamic variables actually grab memory from the heap as opposed to the stack, which actually lie, sorry, like other variables, which are located on the opposing sides of old memory. So it's like you're kind of playing jigsaw, sorry, kind of juggling back and forth with the memory at that point, seesaw on it. And of course, variables are actually assigned different addresses within a system's memory with standard variables starting from the top of the stack and down there variables starting from the bottom of the heap. And with this, stack memory usage actually increases as more local variables request to use it and starts with larger addresses and it actually grows upwards, meaning the numbers and addresses decrease. So you see here with these examples and the heap likewise is the opposite. So it's kind of shows you that heap and a stack. So all that memory that's in your stack is going to be at the top, all the memory in the heap is going to be at the bottom. And whatever you do, you don't want those two to touch. Pretty much thinking you have a heap and stack, like they're two Ghostbuster blasts going back and forth. Never cross strings or cross paths with those two or those bad things happen to your system. And of course, what happens if the hacks or the stack and the heap meet each other? <laughs> Worse than the blue screen is done. Very bad things that happen. Mirror choice to override other areas. And of course, you're operating some crashes. And in fact, also allows information to actually overwrite. Right. This fact is also actually allows information to overwrite other information and scripts the integrity of your data, which then makes it explodable. And of course, this is commonly done in case of buffer overflow, which literally means that data actually gone passes the boundary of addresses or buffers in memory that overflow into other areas of your memory, which actually made it possible on this machine because it actually running Windows CE. So someone found a vulnerability within Windows CE. But oh, guess what? They actually read actual software CDs this way, so let's figure we're going to put some onside code in there. Oh, we're going to run onside code. So now we can hook up stuff into it, such as serial connector that actually read from SD card readers or have a serial port going in that read from actual physical hard drive. Or even more so, go in there, take you know, gut the machine and start putting SATA components in, like SATA CD-ROM drive or a SATA hard drive in there as well. But I feel like doing all that, I stuck a um, uh, SD card reader in there and left it alone. Because if I got through all that, I'll 
build my own machine from scratch. <clears throat> and of course, use an FTP or similar connection onto the original Xbox dashboard. As a change to fun, and actually allow hackers to bypass security to run unsigned software because of a flaw linked to how the funnel is handled in memory. And for obvious reasons, the Xbox is like this big and have the gigantic Duke controller. I didn't feel like hauling that thing in here because I think a lot enough people have already seen the Xbox running Linux already on YouTube, so I'm not going to bore people to death by showing stuff that I've seen like a thousand times already. <laughs> and most people have already seen what the dev chart with the GNOME desktop looks like anyway, so I don't think there's any point in doing that next we done for another meeting. Okay, now for the fun stuff, we'll see on the Sega Dreamcast as I mentioned earlier. And of course, the model version, model one version of this console had features, such as resource CDs that almost nobody used. And the way that Windows C actually implemented the feature actually let the device borrow with the exploits that would actually allow people to run unsigned code, as I'm doing right here on this string right here. And for anyone to ask you, see the screen? Yes, I am kind of mimicking the old Sega CD commercial where it said, Welcome to the next level. Oh, so yeah. it's slowly, procedurally generating out in the screen there. So it says, Welcome to the next now, level. Do you add more RAM to make it faster, or is that one of the things that we're going to learn how to do? Um, probably, I probably could, but here's the thing. This, the um, case is so small, at this point, I'd say your best bet is actually just use a regular hard drive. I'm sorry, just build a regular PC at that point. Oh. Xbox wasn't that bad. Xbox, you got all the extra room in there, so you actually could easily pop the 64 RAM stick out and then put a 128 meg RAM in there. Oh. And also, the fact that I'm measuring memory within megabytes probably means, yeah, if you're going to be doing all that, just build yourself a small PC. Harm yeah, will be like the Raspberry Pis. I was also going to be rather fighting about that that would be redundant considering we're doing the internet of things on Thursday. I think Cliff will probably go more in depth about the Raspberry Pis. Just Thursday. a little bit, but you can talk about the gaming side. Yeah. You know, Raspberry Pi, you know, you just pretty much burn an image to an SD card. You can pretty much go online easily because there are plenty of images you can put on there for the Raspberry Pis. And right now, I should recommend getting a Raspberry Pi too. Oh, that's it. Because, you know, it's like it has almost twice the horsepower for the same price as Raspberry Pi, so I say, for five dollars more, old Raspberry Pi thing running about twenty bucks. Yeah. Raspberry Pi two you can get for twenty five dollars. Yeah, it's a it's a quad core machine now. So you might as well pay twenty five bucks. Yeah, twenty five dollars. Yeah, twenty five dollars. Yeah, it's quad core, uh, one gig of uh, RAM, HDMI output, and more. It has more of the general purpose I/O ports as the uh, newer version. I'll, I, I'll go bring in one because I have one in the car. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as you can see here, that's finally loaded up so you see the title screen for the game. Yeah. So I just did use some bitmap and tools to get that thing up and running. And of course, while this feature actually later started to get out of the sake of the console market, it could have actually had some serious consequences later on, especially for users with browser connections that actually are still trying to run older web browsers. Because you got to think of a barn operating system and a web browser has not been updated in five years. Doesn't exactly sign two things that go together. No. So I probably about anybody who's running the Dreamcast, if you're trying to run the original web sorry, the web sorry, the original web browser or even internet or especially Internet Explorer, <laughs> stop. <laughs> Cause you're trying to run Internet Explorer 4.0 in 2015, you're gonna have some problems. What? You mean that's not the problem? Yeah. And of course, since also another thing we'll look at will be power considerations. And of course, systems may be very limited in storing and data in terms of file size. However, please note that with the browser now being over a decade old, it is also open to a wide array of, sorry, a wide array of vulnerabilities. So if you were going to use this device for web browsing, I highly suggest you pretty much try to run it through either BSD or DOS, like I'm running now, but primarily probably like a pure BSD installation. Because there actually are a few drivers out there that are still kind of somewhat experimental where you can actually go ahead and install NetBSD to an SD card and then from there start installing your software. All this I'm warning you now is basically this version of BSD is pretty much almost primarily text based. So if you can deal with a text based operating system or any real type of GUI, then go at it. But once again, I think that may have been up beyond the scope of a uh, presentation where you're talking about gaming. <laughs> so I had the space bar that goes to the next screen. As mentioned earlier, since it's a slower machine, CPU and RAM, 
I kind of checked the flash the light here up in SD card to make sure that she was loading the memory. <coughs> so right now, as mentioned earlier, I'm actually going to show you guys demonstrations of unsigned code running on the SD card through the serial port and the Dream Show utility to actually bypass the system's software protection. So to get this up and running, I basically use the old school BGI libraries that go ahead and print some bitmaps of the screen. And if anyone has ever been a tech day at UFD within the last few months, it just looks familiar, it should, because this is pretty much what the reminisce of the net chuck there we pretty much built for the tech day that the kids kind of learn about science and engineering. So this little program I should build in there. So this is actually built in Turbo C++ having kids go through different questions and answers, and then of course you get different video or different images based on your answer whether it's right or wrong. So, what I can do while this thing crawls, I can actually open up the IDE on Windows, because there actually is a Turtle Seal Plus now for Windows that runs on Windows 7 and Windows 8. So in case you guys want to try some of this stuff at home, I highly recommend you download Turbo C++. Yep, and of course, the same you can you can do the C sharp instead of C++? I believe that's the two. Yeah, but that's going to kind of get later on with that. That should be for a different piece of hardware. Okay. Yeah, don't work well. It's probably going to work for this. No, maybe it's too good. Like I said, this is actually run a DOS emulator. Mm -hmm. Or you can run it through one of the CEs. Yep. Neither one of those built in network. C sharp or .NET that well anyway. So they probably, but that's, of course, you're pretty much going to be stuck with C++. Yeah, I think that's basic. the Raspberry Pi one machine. is two. I mean, well, you almost can't take it. We'll talk about it later different. on. It's bad to go talk about different topics. Yes, yeah, yeah. another, yeah. Visual Studio 2015 actually will let you actually build software to run on Xbox One now. Oh, based on what I've seen on the latest Microsoft forums so and from their actual websites. So the idea is actually have to unify application. So basically, you use Visual <laughs> Studio 2015. Mm -hmm. So now you'll be able to build your apps to run on Windows 10, phones, Windows 10 tablets, Windows 10 desktops, as well as Windows 10, which is actually, well, a little bit of most of the will be installed into the Xbox One via the dashboard updates later on this year. Mm -hmm. So that way, they have compatibility across all platforms. Okay. Now, the interesting would be if they can get Steam That's to run the through there. Raspberry Pi if they get Steam to run inside that, then basically the Sony has officially lost mm -hmm. all of their exclusives, except for Drake, except for like Uncharted 4 and Guardian, whatever it is. That may be oh, Guardian game. Yeah. Last Guardian. Because oh, I checked E3, and ironically, it seems like every game that Sony said was an exclusive, except for those two, were all games that are already available on Steam. Which is why I got an Xbox One instead of uh, you PS4. You got to have a chip to even burn it, don't you? What? You got you to gotta mod your uh, system to even burn it, though, don't you? Burn what? Right now. Because you well, said they had it on Steam. This is Steam without a torrent site. No, I said Steam. Oh. Like, you know, the actual the BIOS software service. Because I know it seems like with Xbox One. Yeah, that's what I said. I thought it was a torrent service. Oh. No, that's legit. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, for this game, instead of so, depending on your CN and CL statements, mm -hmm. you use the keys in there, answer so one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. You key in the right answer, you see a good image, key in the wrong answer, you see a bad image. Mm -hmm. Trying to step the code for you guys. Here we go, right here on the same line of code. So right here, you got the get answer, which would be Dimitri Anovic. So you go through the code here. I see in two. So that bitmap showed up. So first you have space for continue. And then from there, I'll take you to the next question. This is going to be slower on me mousing through DOS or this thing loading. Okay, so the next thing you'll see is going to be what invention is the American inventor Thomas Edison most famous for? 
And I think this one's actually blowing up slow because it's kind of uh, screwed up. Hit my phone and put up to the SD card. Number four. Now, what language are you programming in here? Oh, uh, this is C++ I'll use for this one. And there was another one, like I was done, like you know, done on like regular C. That actually did the mouse movement before. Sorry, the actual animation movements back and forth with the Pong example I have on here as well. Mm -hmm. So you guys said, of course, uh, type in the four, hit enter, and let's check the code. Okay, if action two equals four, you see the light bulb bitmap. <laughs> and that's the first time I think where where I talk about why I should go through code and actually talk at the same time. Actually works at the, works at the same speed as the output on the other screen. Okay, at the same time, I might actually go ahead and do the rest of this example through the actual Windows machine. So that's how the intro is supposed to look. Yeah, so when you have a quad core CPU, it goes a lot faster than that. <laughs> for obvious reasons. These are 35. And not to mention the fact that it's actually running straight from you know where it operates versus an operating system that's just run through emulation on top of everything else. It is actually running BIOS through an x86, sorry, it's running an x86 emulator on top of a uh, sorry 200 megahertz Hitachi chip. So it actually reads it as a 7 megahertz 286 chip from back in the 80s. That's what was loading so slowly. And then since half the RAM had to actually be used for the emulator itself. Only 16 megs of RAM were available. So it's almost, and realistically, since the chipset was so it's old, 16 megs. 16 megs are only available. Oh. And I think it was only 8 megs at the time. So you have 8 megs at 7 megahertz. Your speed is not going to be that fast using C++ plus through the emulation for that. It's going to be extremely slow. So right now, it's like speed for the questions. Here is going a lot quicker, and yes, I did put Kanye West as the question. <laughs> like, what's the nucleus? It's not Kanye. LucasArts also, Lucas Arts also, back in the day, had something as the Scum engine. I found a few weeks ago that it actually was a port that should run Dreamcast at full speed. Unfortunately, I, no, you know, I did not have enough time to actually go in there and try to code directly from the Scum engine, even though most of it actually is pretty much similar to C++ or similar to C. So if you're programming C language, it should be relatively easy to go into the Scum engine and never build your own games like Lisa Super Larry and those type of games. Huh. The old Sierra games. Or Monkey Island. And I put a wrong answer in there, and I got to simulate it. And FYI, I guess you guys are available next week Saturday. <laughs> mm -hmm. And actually, since this is actually on a fast CPU, there's a few more things I can do.
Yeah, because this is just, you know, CPU cycles, and I found out that for some reason the audio drivers within that version of the bounce box didn't exactly work. So rather than waste the CPU cycles on a very limited it's machine already, I said let me go ahead and comment that out. And you guys may want to pay attention to this, something known as a sound delay, no sound, sound delay, no sound. This is how they actually did MIDI sounds. Start music and video games way back in the eighth day. So that's how basically that's how they did it for the old 8 bit systems. I have a meeting with the uh, our information exchange meeting. Is that where you ask questions? Oh, you can ask questions here too. Oh no! If, if you have a question, let Will know. Yeah, right now probably a good time to do a double open discuss because it may take a while to make these last little comments. Yeah, yeah ask them now. That's oh. what that's what we're here for. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I teach uh, for the Charter Public School, <laughs> and I was just telling the gentleman here. What's your name? Cliff. Sir? Cliff Sam. Uh, Mr. Samuel, I was very impressed with the young people here and um, the way they were handling the, um, the Raspberry Pi and they were looking at it very like in, they were engaged and I was wondering how can we get something like this into our school so some of my students, some of my young men and young women can be exposed to this. How can we do that? I run I was kind of thinking the same thing because, as I mentioned earlier, this actually was part of a project we did for Tech Day at U of Mercy, where we actually got high school students to come around to kind of get different technologies out there. Yeah. So one idea that popped in my head was, okay, why don't we try to bridge the gap between this time about computers and hardware and programming by showing some, something that you built with the software and the hardware, such as some video games. And now, especially with these $9 mini computers coming out, we pretty much build your own devices with those. That should get more interesting in hardware as well. And even nowadays, of course, with the Raspberry Pi, because things like more modular and better yet, the Arduinos. Because our students are more consumers than, than uh, right. builders. Right, makers, right. Yeah, they right. will go on a GG kid in a minute and a Nick, but to make their own game, I would love for them to see them make their own game. Can that be done? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, even if it's just a simple, you know, side scroller like hey, Mario. Man. Yep. Yeah. They can do that. Yeah. Yeah, because I just want to show you guys now a real basic Send me an email. Stuff. I can send you some links to some sites you can check out yeah. that will give you information, especially on Raspberry Pi since it's so cheap. DPS can't complain if you bought a few of those and want to use them. I can buy that myself. Yeah. Yeah, I want, want them to know. Yeah, because yeah, what's, what's the turnaround like if they want to make a side scroll? How long would that take them to do? It's a, well, There's it's a not more language. time, it's more of getting them engaged. Because what you want them to do is learn the concepts of what they're actually doing. Because See, I can shoot wants. code, but then you go, well, what the heck is going on? And sure, that's what you want the kids to understand is what's going on. Trying to talk behind and, the scenes. Right. Behind Mario. Right. What's right. To say, yeah, yeah. With this language, you show this, and you see this result. 
Right, because that's, that's, what, that's what they want. Oh, to that's what they're here for. Yes. Yeah, oh. but that's kind of like my so most going to this because no way you want to get that time you can really go over. Yeah, that's what you have to do. Like, there's going to be questions. The Raspberry Pi was actually developed for education in England. Okay. So that's what I said. There's a, there's a lot of good sites just for teachers and stuff that has all the research for you to get started. And you say that's your content right there. Yeah, that's your content. That's why it's kind of like more content. That's why it's probably best time to learn. People start to get that. I always get the hardest one out that you know people are going to be looking for in your resume. So you know the harder one. If they're kind of trick them down to the easier ones. Or kind of go back and forth between the hard and the easy ones. Basically, it's a socket scroll. Pretty much get it done over. But you have to get into it too. Yeah, yeah, I'd recommend almost, if you, if you come to Thursday, I'd wear my information exchange and, and afterwards I can so talk to you and have you get set up so you can learn so and start right playing now, with it yourself. Pretty much so. just going to input out clips, so the most yeah, important yeah, thing is more of your SQL Plus version that includes this little device, cases that you can compute inside, and it includes the string.h, and that's pretty much allows you to put your text to the screen and your input outputs to CMC out space. And then of course the graph.h, and this program is definitely updated since it's all more standard now. Because this actually is an original program way back in the day. Uh, so this website is what called that the, uh, the Khan Academy. Yes. So obviously, you can put the Khan Academy on. Huh? That's what they use on. Actually, I'm using right now the software to call for the SD card. So obviously, you can literally a large chunk of the, of the Khan Academy on this. So when this came out, it was a full Sega Saturn. Even more looking at the process, I was thinking of it. And learn from the content. That's how old school this is. Okay, so come back Thursday. Thursday, just grab me after the meeting. So, of course, you got to know how to actually okay. use your variables. But I'm still going to email you. Okay. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, variables basically use the whole yeah, bits yeah, piece of your computer with the memory. So, yeah. And also, loops. And so if you have a good chance, you know, this summer. No different decisions you make. So, you can show the one thing. It's a little pricey, but for teaching. We can have a decision to do something else. It's called the main thing. Also, you have to have a thing at certain points as well. Kind of like what's over there. Right, well, the, the make is a big event at the Henry Ford, which they bring so people together right and make fast forward this. variety of things, from software to giant fire-breathing robots. And they have also had the kids there on the robotics teams. So it's a good way to expose yourself. Okay, so next question, basically, you see the see out statement. So see out basically print out the screen English. what you want the people to see on your screen. And right above it, I'm also doing a show bitmap function from the Doc Rockets header file. <laughs> And it's saying 160 but the politics, and 140 those pixels on the screen. Yeah, we've tried. So we've it's kind of like your X and Y access. Oh. Okay. If you have a graph paper. That's why we're in the shape. And that's when I got saw Arco today where I said, yeah, think about like you have a graph paper okay. like you're in your math or geometry class. Okay. So your okay. 160 oh, is at that access point. And your 140 is in your wife. And you have your email so address on there? Well, you send an email in. And then you point okay. to this picture. Right, now so you guys want to start drawing from this quarter. So, okay, you go to the 160 X quadrant quadrant of your screen at the 140 Y quadrant, and that's your start point is, and you just kind of draw it out to your bitmap is filled. Right. So it kind of points out like that. And then, of course, right after we have the C, C out statements, and since this thing actually has the Y at 140, I had to go down 140 pixels first. So it gives you enough space to put this text in there. So you guys should read the text about it as you write in the top, you know, for the image won't go over the text itself. So that you gotta be careful of. And then here I have the CN statement, and that's kind of like your input. So you kind of look at it like this C out, C plus plus, so I'll write you have your C and then your output. C in, right. you have your C and in your input. Now is that what it is asking for the user's input? Yep. Okay. So then I have that variable set for input known as action five for the fifth question. So if action one, so let's say choose a one, you show the sad face. Sorry, I'm wrong answer. Please press face bar to continue. And then of course your score, or you scroll down a little bit, goes down. And now can you explain why there's two minuses? Huh? Why there's two minuses? Okay. Minus minus does a decrement and plus plus is an increment. And that's kind of how the language is set up, the syntax is set up. So plus plus, raise the score for the variable, but it's an integer right now. So the integer is actually initiated at zero. So in this quiz game, it's kind of set up like Jeopardy. So if you get a wrong answer, you lose five points. You get a right answer, you gain five points. 
So it's like people being a really track. And of course, this one is a score plus place to get the right answer. Yep. And once again, it draws the image at certain parts of the screen, so don't interference with the text and the text right there. So let's go ahead and rerun it. And one thing you will notice is that I actually did remove certain comments from sound. So you got to see what this thing sounds like, or hear what it sounds like. Sega! Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> And this is actually my failed attempt to try to reproduce Super Mario Bros. a few months ago. Oh, I got Nintendo, I told you, dude. <laughs> so now, let's say you type in a bad answer. Get that noise. Get a good answer. And you hear this. And so I did not add any audio to the rest of these. It's going to just randomly go through this. There's another file I can show you guys real quick. So uh, to the same, just open up C files. And I'll choose huh. Now this is the old school C, so it actually used the put statements instead. using the old school just Dawson time functions. So it's set up so you actually use the arrow keys to go up and down. So using different open source libraries I found on the internet, I was able to, you actually can create Pong, but unfortunately right now, only game I can build is basically this, and then the old Sega CD FMV games. And of course, as you're able to see from the demonstration that I wrote and filed on my Windows machine is now up and running on Dreamcast. And of course, like I just said, DOSBox for the Dreamcast Turbo Studio Plus are basically the perfect tools that demonstrate this concept. Or as I mentioned earlier, with this thing being a such a slow CPU and processor, processor with a limited amount of RAM, you probably may as well stick to the text-based software for this. At this time, you're going to use C++ Plus or use the Scum library. Which lets you do the Lucas Art type of stuff I mentioned earlier. Okay. So basically, you're limited to what you just saw Pong, Lucas Art type of games, and then text based games. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the only problem is that the Dreamcast will run because the Nintendo Store senses so much stored in the CPU on the current desktop and is running off of emulation. And actually, this basically crucial to test on actual hardware to ensure the code is actually executed correctly without latency issues. And furthermore, it's also why I use the SD card versus the actual CD-ROM because of the transfer speeds or file transfer speeds from the CD-ROM versus the SD card. And I ran into someone on Instagram when I posted, you know, a few pics that I actually advertised this event a few months ago, or I redid this originally with UFD. Someone asked me like, why am I using the USB to type of a memory card reader? I told him like, dude, the motherboard does not support USB three. <laughs> Oh, what? Huh? What were you talking about? Some guy actually asked me why I might buy this thing just using a regular serial port instead of a, 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 not using the USB 3 on there. I told him, realize how old that was? I was going to kind of explain to him, like, you do realize back in the year 1999, USB 3 was not invented. Right. You were lucky we got USB 1.0. 1.1. <laughs> <laughs> 1. <laughs> and then, of course, with Windows, it's kind of that exactly when it really was plug and pray it works. <laughs> The old dial-up. Yeah, 98, you're fine, but if you're around Windows 95, oh boy. <laughs> now, 
Now, how would you want to, if you were going to actually make stuff to really run a Dreamcast, what would you have to do to optimize that code to run at the Dreamcast speed? So that's it looks gonna, like. That's what I get the next day. I also had some notes like a ton of libraries that Marcus originally had. Now, and then that's where people kind of run to that gray area where one minute they say, go ahead, it's like one minute they say it's not legal to use because it's not licensed. And then one minute they're saying, like, you know, we're not supporting anymore, we don't care. So it's like one of those kind of gray areas. I'm like, Microsoft, make up your mind. Either tell us we can use it or don't let us use it. And that's somewhere you can download. Like, it's actually free yeah. to free to download, but I think they're more concerned that you actually have a Visual Studio license at this point. Uh, and on top of that, I think this also goes back to back in the day where they were like more streaming with the Visual Basic, sorry, Visual Studio licenses than they are now. Because now you get the community version of Visual Studio for free. So that's probably where they're like, yeah, whatever, because it's probably a much older version of it. So I assume, okay, if you're using Visual Studio. And that's the like component for Visual Studio that they're no longer using or utilizing anymore. It's called very ancient hardware. Then they're like, hey, what's the point of even charging you? Because you can't even get a license for it at this point. So I guess I say, you know, just use a vanilla Visual Studio license and go from there. I think that's because actually companies actually are using it right now. So I think Marcel kind of has kind of said, you know what? Do whatever you're going to do. We're just charge you later on once you use licenses and agreements. Because most people are only making like two games for the system a year at this point now, anyway. So it's at the point where the user base is like so small that there's a product called Microsoft more money to get a lawyer team to try to charge people you know. extra money for extra licenses than the courts have to say, like, you know, just pay the vanilla Visual Studio license for $100 per user and leave it and call it a day. Yes. Which kind of does make sense because they need to spend all those resources chasing the little guys or B, charge everybody to use vanilla license to cover every platform. But of course, means more revenue from the long run anyway. And of course, another issue we may run into with some of the native open source. Of course, I was trying to just go with the open source current our IDEs and development environments. Unfortunately, a lot of them, a lot of sites that had like new stuff mixed in with old school IDEs, mixed with older IDEs, kind of a mismatch. So here's the problem. I started running some code in terms of this software that it was actually code written for an IDE or development kit that came out 10 years ago. So of course you try to run like a newer version of code block, it's not gonna work. So that's something you gotta be aware of. Oh you and that time after I messed around Windows for like the last three months, I found out it's actually bad to try to program this at Linux because I found out when I found out something actually did work, that should probably run the compiler thing at full speed. It has a requirement is called GCC libraries for my machine. At that point, I'm not going to GCC, chart GCC. That's all Linux based and GNU based. So at that point, just run it on a GNU operating system like Linux or even BSD. Okay, we're going to the C++ code already. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, text based events is probably the easiest and most simple, simplistic way to actually start everything off. And of course, once you learn about how to make variables, decision blocks, and loops, along with input output commands, we mentioned earlier with the CNC, I'll say with C++, building text prevention becomes a very simple process. So basically, it'd be like the game example I showed you, but just with text instead of images. And of course, you can also hack ROMs. There was a game, let's say, just called Rock and Roll Racers, which was actually one I found after playing around with some of the stuff they had online, it was the easiest. Game I actually try to hack into. So we're going to games. So it actually has a program called Add Intro Gen. Now, unfortunately, for lack of I can't figure out exactly what the right type of file use for this was. So I said whatever, just kind of play around with it. So here I just can find a bin file to open. So I changed the hex variables in there. It kind of like lets them know that hey guess what you, you want to actually change some section in the code itself. It's already pretty far into the image. I'm not gonna actually export it. <coughs> okay, now add an image in there. Oops, has to be a bit 
map. Then another thing to do with this game was actually go in here, so I'm just going to track editor. Hopefully this time that shoot works. Yeah, that's one thing you do is add the tracks and then even add the cars. And this kind of disappointed me because when I played around this earlier, I thought I could do a whole bunch more things with the cars. Unfortunately, not so much. <laughs> it just basically lets you paint in different colors. Uh -oh. And ironically, after I said that now, so I guess it wants to work better than it did before at home, which I cannot complain about. Okay, we go and switch to the other car. Okay, that's something that really happens when you do an actual demonstration where technology doesn't work at home, but South Virginia demonstration itself. Okay, save changes. Check the date modified, make sure you have the most current version in here selected. <coughs> and also, you also want to probably make sure you have an original version of your file so you don't screw anything up or get screwed up. At least have a backup, so I have a backup right there. Paste into the folder. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, as you can see here, it's seeing some of the crazy color changes I did in there. Did not exactly like the bit map that I threw in. It's on static. So actually what you showed is take a existing game and go inside and modify the code. Exactly. Even though nowadays you buy most games, well, most recent games, they pretty much already had that feature built in for you. You can go in there and modify the car, paint different colors, and add decals and everything else to it. Which actually brings back memories of the old Ridge Virtual game from the PlayStation 1. Or the, sorry, Ridge Virtual 4. And of course, how does everyone feel about the FMV games from the old Sega CD games? And of course, this technique is actually being used on YouTube with simple scripts and can actually be done incredibly easily with Java thanks to the libraries that are already available. 
And you know, of course, for this, all you really need would be a good video editor, like open shot if you're on a Lexus machine, movie maker if you're on Windows, even iMovie if you're on a Mac. So a simple video editing program, and it's something to convert the video that you actually finished or the MPEG program file into something that your compiler, your desktop environment will actually understand. Because you know what your compiler code has to be a certain file format, otherwise it won't compile it properly. And then last but not least, I have some audio tool. If you're audio, editing audio files, I recommend using Audacity. And most tools right now pretty much recognize the dot .wave extensions. Or dot, sorry, .wave PCM files, your best bet. So far, it's the easy way to build your big games would be to actually download and install a Java compiler with Swing or Java FX. And then use the GIF animation classes. I know people will complain about being real crude and real simple, but at the same time, you're just trying to build a real simple game, go with a cheap, simple, dirty way of getting it done. Because <laughs> you probably you build, you probably able to build a game within two days versus trying to spend two months trying to build the same game, trying to build it from scratch. Okay, that's the one beauty about open source is the stuff for is already there, why are we trying to reinvent the wheel? And of course, likewise you edit your video with Movie Maker or iMovie open shot, you get a decent MPEG 4 file. And then likewise, once you get your file set to it, you build your logic and your code that should go with the animated GIF. So pretty much say, okay, if this inside I want a GIF file to go to this portion of the animation and start and rotate, sorry, go to this part of the animation and go all the way through, or stop this portion of the animation, or start at this portion of the animation and go to this point. Or the video, it's kind of the same idea. So it's a five minute video clip. I want to use the second <coughs> first minute point, run that portion of the video, this happens. And someone else has to run that portion of the video. So also got to do nothing else. Have a video editor installed so you actually know how to get a timeline in place, so you know what portion of the video to cut back and forth. And one thing to consider when using Java, you're running a, a real slow desktop. You may have to make your audio file a MIDI file if you're trying to target some, someone that has a machine like less than like a dual. CPU or like a less than like a two megahertz or two gigahertz machine, even though right this day and age, hopefully most people are already at least on a dual core, two megahertz processor in a machine. If you're still running a single core, you got to use the MIDI files. Now, now we can tell you a story about how Battle Cat took flight outside now. Let's start with the 
we're trying to make tracks together. Obviously, you can also go in there and actually adjust the volume as well. So let's say the vocals weren't that loud, the music was overpowering, so I'll just go to oh, amplify. So basically, you highlight amplify, and you guys adjust the decibel level on that. So you go to effects, amplify. So here it's too loud, so I want to get quieter. So hit OK for that. So now when I play it back. You can hear the first one with that. So it kind of gives you an idea how you can actually mix audio tracks with audacity. And just like folks on Audacity, you can use it to even import an MP3 file and you can mix with Audacity, which he's shown it's a multi track editor. So basically, if you want to make your own uh, hip hop record or something, you use Audacity to at least get you set up because uh, it's all digital output. So it's going to be high quality depending on the, your inputs and your mic uh, equipment that you use. And a lot of people, if you've heard of what podcasting, that's available on iTunes and out on the internet. That's what a lot of people are using for the editor is Audacity. There's more expensive versions out there, but that's free and it does about 90% of what you're going to need. Is, does it have the ability to master audio or is that even is it necessary to master? It's not really necessary because you're in the digital realm now. Mm -hmm. So basically it's the quality of your digital content that you pull into Audacity okay. is your true limit. Because okay. it, it can save it out in a multitude of formats. Mm -hmm. So if you, as long as the, the key on the thing on Audacity is keep it inside of its native format before you convert it to MP3. Okay. So the more raw, it, the more you keep it in the raw format, the the better the quality. But once you start going back and forth for MP3, it degrades. Okay. Yeah, one thing that I thought was funny is you guys start playing Sonic on the Nintendo system. Well, now someone has a Mario clone on Dreamcast. <laughs> so someone first decided to make Tux, sorry, sorry, Super Tux, using the Tux mascot, and then they came up with Super Mario Chronicles. Mario Kart games are out there on the PC as well. And of course, most games in the Dreamcast that had audio hacks for racing games, as well as fighting games, most noticeably Capcom vs. Marvel 2 and King of the Fighters 2012. And here's another the development tools you may want to play around with later on. So, not to know as Atari Visual Basic, in case you have an Atari 2600 or a 7800 lying around with a flash cartridge. And then for the actual GameCube, there's us some home for stuff for there as well. And then last but not least, like I mentioned earlier, you have Visual Studio for your Windows apps and one the Microsoft products. So actually, while I have that out, and since I just mentioned the GameCube, the Max Drive, which in case you look at the side of it, there's actually a USB adapter. And this actually allows it to actually run, start copy files to your GameCube, and from there they also included both a PC driver disk and this CD that actually lets you run your own on-site code in there. So I'll go ahead and try it up.
And likewise, they also have the Game Boy Advance port. So they actually brought some flash cards for the Game Boy Advance that actually let you run unsigned code in Game Boy Advance, the original DS, and of course the regular Game Boy. You got the flash cards. So you see it loads both your homebrew games and then even your game saves on there. And I was thinking this shit actually load a lot faster than the Dreamcast loaded. Number one, it's a slightly faster CPU and it's actually it said they're actually running natively inside the machine. And then it's actually Yes, it's probably the nerdiest thing I've posted to this channel in history. So, does anyone have any questions? Well, I guess the big thing is how, would, since we have a quite a few youth here, how would they, what would you suggest for them to get involved <coughs> into game development? What would they need to, what, what resources are available for them to learn how to, the basics of putting together a simple game and moving up through the uh, advancement of gaming? I would say probably Visual Studio might be the best bet for that, and then of course NetBeans. And I don't know how I actually skipped over the NetBeans itself because I had the folder open and everything. So I'm actually glad you brought that up because at first I'm like, okay, this thing seemed like it was just like 90 minutes, I'm done in, in 70. I should be, I felt like I was doing something, and that's what it was. We got to go over NetBeans. And that's one thing I actually think Patrick, I actually think Patrick for this because he told me, don't suffer all day with the clips, try NetBeans instead. Give you a little friendlier IDE. Yeah, at this point it's already compiled, but basically they kind of give you the whole drag and drop interface for you. It's got it's also plugins for it that should work probably on a desktop though, but it lets you drag and drop everything so you don't have to worry about trying to color everything in there, trying to almost just grab it where it's going to go on the screen. Here you just drag and drop it. Same thing goes to Visual Studio and Visual Studio Plus works the same way as well as leave the C sharp. So for the newer you don't have to worry about all that. Well, what's the primary difference between uh, this and uh, Eclipse? It just seemed like this, like we you know, like when I downloaded it years ago, it just seemed like this interface is a little bit easier to use than Eclipse, or it seemed like it was less cumbersome. So basically, it's the same thing. Just I think just the interface difference. That's it. Okay. And right now, I think Eclipse actually has probably I think they have tightened up their interface somewhat since then. Because it's like 10 years ago, and perhaps first showed me this. So anything else does with software, as something's been out for a while, it matures. It does get better over time. So as mentioned earlier, of course here once again you have your variables you're selecting, and it's of course should be familiar, familiar but set up in C plus syntax and then Java syntax. So right now it's actually asking for the radio button set up to actually input the keyboard. So you have a question here, then your if then statement that was in the other, earlier versions of now, you know how um, much you can use different type of variables, a different actual file, inputs and outputs. So here I can use full GIFs, a few WAV files, and a MIDI file at the beginning. So it shows the difference in there. And once again, this is actually NetBeans and HR on version 8 right now. So this is actually we show the U of D for the Technology Discovery Day. So you know it's a huge leap and bounce from technology that was in the Dreamcast game versus this. Similar to Mark Fury, your game went like this with similar logic.
then you see a clip from Big Buck Bunny, which is actually the open source movie that's out there. So you see clips from different open source and public domain videos, well as videos from my YouTube channel and there's all kinds of spice together. So okay, which of the following is not a major function of the system nervous system? That would be auditory function. And what type of energy does not have when it's sitting still? That would be potential. I'm just going to put the one answer here just because I did a silly video to go with this. So I'm tripping and falling over the place. The bottom saves the strip all virtualization. It's done in traffic emulation. And I kind of try to have the video somewhat match the questions. So here's a video I did earlier on with emulation and virtualization on the OS 10 running Netrunner. So mostly you just have what's the coding that you've done. This is more conditional statements. Right. So if they pick you know, the right answer in the conditional, then it just shows a different image or video. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I figure like something like this is probably easier to do it because you know so you have something that actually looks decent, you actually have a game, but it's not that hard for someone to call. Mm -hmm. We did this all in um T plus plus. No, this one was done in Java. The text based one I showed you guys earlier on C++ plus is Java, and actually I actually did build this on top of a previous C++ game that I had earlier on, but C++ has some limitation where I can do graphic wise, actually audio and also bit audio wise. Mm -hmm. So for some reason I was using my older version of Visual Studio, mm -hmm. audio I was stuck with MIDI files. Mm -hmm. And of course, comparing MIDI files to full WAV files is like night and day. Mm -hmm. Resolution of video is also different because I was stuck with almost like 240 resolution for images. Here I can use HD, and obviously that's another huge improvement. Mm -hmm. And it was just a major fair clip for that portion. This touch came from some random anatomy video that I was actually on the internet archive that someone did. And then here's the ending that we actually edited. So the audio that you're going to see it here in the editing, the ending, actually I made this on a dash set to my buddy Simon MP3. And then for the video portion, we actually spliced together the clips we did on our own. So basically, I kind of took his audio, mixed it with our video, and then put it to the game itself, so, colon wire. Hey, listen, I know you have dreams, but you can't compare yourself. So in the original version, he was rapping, like, and sent me to a cloud here my iPhone. I wanted to vastly found a sorry, instrument that maxes his acapella and put it in the game right afterwards. Hey, listen, I Then, back in the day, there was a game all in the NEC, sorry, NEC FX, which came out like, sorry, PC FX, which came out like right the Turbo 16. It was only available in Japan because, you know, it did because the Turbo 16 wasn't that popular here in the US, but very popular in Japan. And one of the games that you made for that system was known as Battle Heat. And that's kind of where I got somewhat the ideas for this, even though I really thought about Puzzle Fighter and in the old Dragon Slayer games. So yeah, Puzzle Fighter, where you got Two guys fighting each other, different almost videos going back and forth. It's kind of what the original GIF version was in Visual Studio. They're like, wait a minute, it's more like Dragon's Zero actual full video. And Battle Heat was kind of the same idea. We had conditional states based on your answer, so that the fire doing different moves, different poses, or different attacks or blocks. So if you hit the right at the right time, they did this. If you asked the right question right, they did that. So I said, okay, people didn't really like Battle Heat because the animation wasn't all that good and it was kind of corny. So what I decided to do as a tiebreaker for a tech day was take something that people actually like, which is Street Fighter, and basically do Battle Heat with Street Fighter characters. And 
Man, if I was raising my cat, at least I'd smoke this camera online. You know, I kind of fish things here and just now, man, new announcement about Street Fighter V for a PS4. Even though I think it should also cover Xbox One and all the versions of PC Operation 7 7's Windows. So you go ahead and start it. So using a fast and big audio editing program, I pretty much built this. And then of course let's download the Bell Step remix of Vice and Steam music. So those actually the type we're gonna have. <coughs> in your uh, quiz bowl, so what uh, curriculum did you use to teach the high school kids how to get into this? Did they have any prerequisites of programming they had to know? or It was kind of like an experimental thing we are just kind of playing around with, so tech data is actually just like a part of it where we just ask different STEM questions. So we are just trying to come up with something that actually you know, look presentable, so, so that was actually an evolution of something that we did earlier on. So we just saw the final product, the original product, so this is what the game originally looked like. You know, Cliff, we did a STEM <clears throat> program with the youth um, back in March. Mm -hmm. um, we helped them develop a, a mobile application, mm -hmm. but it was based on education. So what would they like to see improved? educational system and uh, we had two days to do the project <laughs> which was pretty interesting and uh, the kids got together they brainstormed and we storyboarded it actually came up with the uh, uh, design for that mm -hmm. I thought that was uh, pretty interesting and that would be a good activity for young people you know just like the lady was asking yeah the other lady she was asking yeah, what the teacher, done, DPS, yeah. right for their students and that would be a this suggestion to do, you know, to have some kind of thing where maybe um, several classrooms or even some schools can get together and do something like that. You know, 
for some kind of prize or competition oh, okay. or something like that. But well, that's what we're trying to get BDP to get more of our IT brain power together <laughs> so we can go out here and really you know, make a difference in this new system. That, right, right. Like, so a lot of this is out there and a lot of the curriculum was already developed, so a lot of it we just had to go out there, pull it, and just implement it. Right. That, like I was telling you about the Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi was developed in Great Britain for education. Mm -hmm. So they have a ton of pre-made courseware out there that you can use for students. It slowly have come over to America, but it hasn't really been implemented in the school systems uh, as heavily as it's done in uh, Great Britain. So the give it to somebody. Yeah. Oh, well, let me make a couple, right, couple right, announcements right. before yeah, everyone. Yeah, let's talk about the ball and the band. Yeah, let's talk about that real quick. Um, yeah. Well, um, my name is Michelle Larsosa, and I'm a part of the National Society of Black Engineers, the Detroit Professionals Chapter. I am the incoming chair. Alan here is our incoming membership chair. Will is our uh, one of our PCI chairs, and um, we are planning the upcoming year's event. So, uh, and not this Saturday, but the following Saturday on the 27th, we're having a bowling fundraiser at Plum Hollow Lanes in Southfield. Uh, tickets are $25 for adults and $20 for children, and the money um, that we're raising is going toward our scholarship fund. Uh, for next year. So if you guys are interested, please let myself, Alan, or Will know. And um, we would love to see you on next Saturday. Yeah, BD Pay, we just had our fundraiser last yeah. Saturday yeah, okay. at Blue yeah. Hollow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that I was a little tied up Saturday. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it's, it, it was like everything, everything was back to back to back. But again, I'd like to thank everyone for attending our Technology Automation Committee meeting. This was more to give you an overview on game development, you know, because we really aren't going to have a chance to go deep dive yet. But if there's enough interest, we would definitely like to schedule a meeting and definitely bring the youth in and get them involved into game development. Because there's a lot of resources just that we need to get, get our professionals together to sit down and help them. So again, I'll say BPA. I'm uh, Cliff Samuels, the Technology Automation Vice President. And also we have a meeting this Thursday, and I'll be presenting on the Internet of Things, giving okay. you a high-level view of the next greatest thing in IT. Okay. Because yeah. you've heard a lot of things about this, you know, everyone knows about the Apple Watch and the Nest thermostat. Well, that's just a small sample of what's going on. Because the Google car, that's a part of the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a good overview and then at the end, give you some hints on how, as an IT professional, how you can cash in on this, on this uh, trend. Yep, and one more thing, anybody that's interested to have some of the homebrew games we built. So this is actually stuff we did for Tech Day. And this is something I did last year for Nesby's June meeting. We were talking about fitness yeah. and the yeah. right wellness. Of the wellness. So if anyone wants a copy, they're right there. And then to keep in contact, we, you know, BDP and yeah. we, we, we keep in contact. So maybe we get together and we can do a joint event. Because we have access to the tech town all this week. Uh, yeah, booking ahead of time to get the bigger. Yeah, they don't run the Windows yeah. Micro Linux because that's where it's programmed at Java. That's so all you need is a double run from environment and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I was going to say about the Dreamcast, you can also run different emulators in there as well. So old games, this is running here, like the old Genesis, Super Nintendo, Nintendo, even Atari, as well as some of the old PC software that's running full speed as well. So it's a basic consideration if you don't want to hack into it. All right, everybody, thanks for showing up. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.